This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is economist and podcaster Glenn Lowry, whose amazing new memoir is called Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. I guarantee you it's the only academic memoir you'll read this year that provides the recipe for crack cocaine and a deep discussion of Alberto Hirschman's seminal text in political economy, Exit Voice and Loyalty. Born in 1948 and raised working class on Chicago's predominantly black South Side, Lowry tells a story of self-invention, ambition, hard work, addiction, and redemption that channels Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, Richard Wright's Native Son, Saul Bellow's The Adventures of Augie March, and Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. The first tenured black economist at Harvard, Lowry emerged in the 1980s as a ubiquitous commenter on race and class, and was even offered a post in the Reagan administration. Then a series of scandals involving affairs, arrests, and addiction threatened to end his personal and professional lives. Late Admissions is an unflinching look at Lowry's failures and successes, both public and private, written by someone who was intimately involved in many of the biggest policy and culture war battles of the past 50 years. Here is The Reason Interview with Glenn Lowry. Glenn Lowry, thanks for talking to Reason. Hey, Nick Gillespie, good to be talking to you. (laughs) All right. So the new book, uh, which is amazing, is Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. I guess my first question is, why did you write this now? Well, uh, I've been threatening to write it for 10 years. Uh, It was going to be called Changing My Mind because I thought the story was that I was on the left and then the right and then the left and then the right. And it was about losing friends and coming to epiphanies and regret and you know, uh, not being confined by the blinkered ideology and, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. That's what I thought the book was going to be about. But I, I never could quite write that book. Um, then it was going to be The Enemy Within. Uh-huh. Uh, it was going to be about struggles with addiction and w- with uh, serial infidelity and betraying of people and, and choking and, uh, you know, not living up to your potential, yeah. self-sabotage. It was going to be about that. And that I did get something down on paper. I got a few notes down on paper. But um, uh, I never quite, it never quite came together for me. The yeah. academic year 2015-16, I was on leave from Brown. I was out at Stanford at the Center for Advanced Study. Margaret Levy was the director. I had a wonderful year, good colleagues. And I had nothing but open you know, space in front of me every day was a new day, a uh, quiet office. And I began to try to write this book, but I still couldn't mm. quite get it done. And I left at the end of that year with a pretty good essay and some autobiographical sketches and maybe the framing of an outline or something, but I didn't have the book. So, I mean, the the book itself is all of the things that you mentioned. It's a, it's a story about ideological change or, or I don't, I don't even, I think ideological change is the wrong thing. It's intellectual shifts in perspective and growth and going backwards and forwards. It is about uh, friends and, uh, you know, allies who became enemies or, or at least that you lost. And it's certainly about addiction. And I want to talk a lot about that because it's, really uh riveting i mean i i must tell you glenn that this is my favorite book now about economics because you name check albert hirschman and exit voice and loyalty which is a big book to me and you include a recipe for crack cocaine so this is like (laughs) this has everything in it right you know and it's and you, you know it's a it's a book that no other economist i think would have written um How do you define yourself now when you say uh, you are a black conservative? What does that mean? Because you you went through a phase where you called yourself a conservative. You called yourself, I believe, a neocon for a bit, uh, a progressive at various points. What does it mean to be a conservative to you now? Well, I think of a few things. One of them is thinking pretty much that markets get it right in terms of the resource allocation problem and that uh the planner the planning instinct and centralized you know state centered politically controlled uh interference in the economy is is suspect 
Uh, I mean, of course, there are exceptions, but the general predisposition being that I like prices uh, and, and I like I like laissez faire. And, and I and I think the first and second fundamental theorems of welfare economics are true that, that we get efficient resource allocation when we allow the interplay of self-interest and, you know, mm -hmm. classical kind of liberal stuff. OK, uh, that makes you a, that makes you a libertarian, not a conservative. Okay. Right? Well, the, so, I was going to go to yeah. the Edmund Burke route. I was, okay. was going to say yeah. a, a decent drapery. I was going to say okay. not discarding everything that's been handed to me from the past generations. Right. And I was going to say a little bit of awe and, and reverence in the face mm -hmm. of people's efforts to come to terms with the unfathomable by uh, seeking uh, religious devotion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a respect for tradition, uh, a reverence for uh, some of these things that we've been handed down. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, when people can't define who's a man and who's a woman, I, I hold my wallet. I'm, I'm, I'm a little mm -hmm. bit uh, skeptical about this nouveau thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, but the black conservative yeah. comes out of a, I think, uh, re reflex or reaction to the dilemma that we African Americans face, the descendants of slaves, uh, mm -hmm. marginal population, uh, disadvantaged in various ways, and uh, struggling for equality, dignity, mm -hmm. inclusion, uh, freedom. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's a trap uh, in that uh, in that uh, situation, a, a trap of falling into a status of victim and of looking to the other, uh, the white man, the, the system, mm -hmm. to to raise our children for us and and to deliver us from the challenge, which everybody faces, of living life in in good faith, of as Jordan Peterson puts it, standing up straight with your shoulders back, of 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 confronting the reality that there's some stuff that nobody can do for you that you yeah. you have to do for yourself and that this this posture of dependence this uh repair to arguments about reparations this mm -hmm. uh uh kind of uh, evocation of structural and systemic uh when the real questions are responsibility and well, and and you know, whatever. So yeah, th that's no, another uh, aspect of my conservatism. That's yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, let's talk about that because you grew up in. Uh, you were born in the '40s in uh, in Chicago, and you were raised on the south side of Chicago right. uh, when it was, you know, when it had gone through a, a significant change because uh, a lot of people from the south, a lot of blacks had moved up to Chicago. Uh, it was a thriving black area, but it was also encased in, you know in Jim Crow essentially right um you you stress the your in your family uh that people worked hard uh, you know some people were kind of lost to addiction and things like that but most people worked hard can you talk about what are the lessons that you learned i mean in that context of but being conservative and you want freedom you want markets but you also have um you know a kind of respect for tradition in the past because some of the traditions that you were being raised into or some of those social structures were systemically racist right um you know it was hard for blacks to get jobs or even to go to certain parts of towns um you know certain parts of town and things like that how you know how do you work through that to say you know we want we want what is good from the past but we also need to change the present in order to get to a better place yeah that's a big question nick yeah. um I, I did grow up in chicago in the 19 i was born in 48 in 1950s and 60s um we weren't poor uh my mother's family which is the part of my background that I'm closest to. My mother and father divorced and I was quite early. My father didn't know his father until he was a young adult. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know my father and his mother died. My father's mother died when he was in high school. So I never really as a kid knew my father's parents or his, his uh, ancestors very well at all, but I didn't know my mother's family. Mm -hmm. um, my aunt and uncle in whose household I grew up my mother's sister and her husband were um, strivers. Uh, they they were people who sought respectability. They had a big, beautiful house. They uh, my uncle ran his own business. He was a barber and uh, 
small uh, businessman. Uh, they had a dry cleaners establishment mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, they hustled. Uh, most of what they did was legal. Some of my uncle yeah. sold a little cannabis out of the back of his barber shop. And, mm -hmm. you know, if the Italian guys had some suits that had fallen off the back of a truck, he mm -hmm. probably would end up with a half dozen of them in his shop that he could sell to stuff like that. But he, but, you know, they were hardworking, mm -hmm. working class, middle class uh, people. They were professionals. My uncle, my mother's brother, graduated Morehouse College a year or two ahead of Martin Luther King Jr. Hmm. and uh, matriculated at the Northwestern University School of Law, where he, he got a law degree with uh, people who became federal judges. Harold Washington, the late Hi. Harold Washington, mayor of Chicago, mm -hmm. was a friend of my uncle's and was in his law school class at Northwestern. In any case, <coughs> <clears throat> we weren't poor. The generation before my mother's generation, my grandmother who passed away before I was born, my mother's mother, and her sisters and brothers, there were like a dozen of them. They had come out of Brookhaven, Mississippi, originally had migrated first to Memphis, Tennessee, and then up to Chicago, taking the IC Railroad up north uh, to Freedom Land, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, in the years after World War I, and they came into Chicago uh, around the time of the Depression and a little bit before my mother was born in 1928. And, and by the time I came along 20 years later, that generation, my mother's mother's generation, it was pretty well established. They were property owners and, you know, they did household work and they, they, they worked in the plants, factories, mm -hmm. steel mills and stuff like that. But, but they, they were, they were, uh, respectable Negroes. Mm -hmm. But this is the South Side of Chicago. Uh, and, and, you know, it's segregated. Yes, yeah, Chicago is a very segregated city. The neighborhood that I grew up in and a kid, my aunt and uncle's home was in a neighborhood that had been all white until the mid 1950s when they moved mm -hmm. in. It quickly transitioned to all black 10 years or so in the making of, a, of the uh, of the flipping of the neighborhood, but they were middle-class African-Americans. It was a, a small scale housing, single family and small mm -hmm. apartment buildings. They were well-kept lawns in the front. Uh, you never heard gunshots or found uh, mm -hmm. used the uh, drug paraphernalia in the, uh, in the gutter. Um, we, we weren't worried about people breaking into the house and uh, so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a pretty stable uh, and, and pretty uh, nurturing um, yeah. social environment for me, even though my, my mother didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, and we lived in a small apartment, a two bedroom apartment mm -hmm. carved out upstairs in the back of this grand mm -hmm. house of my aunt and uncles. She um, uh, seemed to be a uh... Uh, driven by sexual appetites that you that seems to be an inheritance that you got probably from her right well she and her brothers uh i, I remark at one point in the book i say the very behavior that i admired in her brothers mm -hmm. they were womanizers and mm -hmm. you know uh we're, we're always bragging about their conquests uh so disturbed me and my mother yeah my mother had four husbands before she passed away and lovers mm -hmm. Uh, I, I paint a scene in the book where I'm in the pool hall. I, I liked uh, playing billiards and, uh, you know, uh, eight ball, nine ball and stuff. And uh, my mother, I see her walking out of a motel that happens to be right across the street from the pool hall with a man on her arm who I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she they walk into the pool hall, I assume, to pass some time. They don't know that I'm there. And, and uh, we, we have this uh, interesting confrontation which is kind of symbolic for me of my difficulties with with my mother's yeah. appetites. Yeah, that that was a theme uh, for me. What um, you know, you you ended up um, uh, getting your uh, the woman who became your first wife pregnant. Um, you know, bef you know when you were. Uh, I guess still in high school, right? Or just after no, I was out of high you school. were going to college, but <laughs> I was a precocious kid. I was 16 graduating high school and I yeah. was 17 when Charlene got pregnant. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. But as I say in the book, I graduated both valedictorian and a virgin. 
uh, because I was younger than all the other kids and a social misfit. Yeah. But I, I, I tried to remedy that situation as quickly as I could. Right. And um, so you when did, uh, you know, again, the, the what what is amazing about this book is, uh, you know, is you talk about economics and your education in economics, and where you're coming from. But then it is a novel about addiction or not a novel, a, a memoir that traffics a lot in addiction, uh, both drug addiction and sex addiction. Where did the uh, where did the sex addiction come from, do you think? Or would you call your sexual behavior, was that addictive behavior? I think you could defend the position that it was addictive behavior. It was certainly habitual. It, it yeah. was uh, uh, self-destructive and uh, harmful to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it gave momentary uh, pleasures, but it didn't, it didn't lead to deeper satisfactions, I came to understand. So it, it has a lot in common with my dependency on cocaine, which uh, mm -hmm. developed uh, later. I mean, it developed in the late 1980s. And mm -hmm. uh, but but my pursuit of uh, sexual gratification outside the, the confines of respectable conduct uh, goes all the way back to my adolescence. And uh, I do talk a little bit about the suppressed longings that I had mm -hmm. as a kid younger than most of my classmates. and. Uh, so on. Uh, there were family pressures. Uh, my uncle, the lawyer, uh, Adler, once told me the, in so many words that the meaning of life was found in getting as much pussy as you could yeah. get. Uh, that's how he put it. Uh, and uh, it reminds me of that scene in the movie Little Miss Sunshine. I don't know if you saw it. There's a <laughs> character. Alan Arkin is the grandfather. Yeah. And that's his advice that's to the cool. grandson that you won't regret it, believe me, just yeah. get as much as you can. And, well, you, you yeah. talk in the book throughout, actually, both in professional settings and personal settings of being a player, of wanting to be a player, you know, and a hustler, a pool hustler, but also, um, is yeah. that, you know, did the, is that just, is it, I don't want to say, is it just something, is is that something that came out of your your kind of childhood settings? You looked up uh, you you write that you looked up to your uncles, your your mother's brothers, and they were both ladies' men, right? Um, and, and your mother aspect, also was searching some for something. Yes, and, I'm, and my my mother's was a man's <laughs> yeah. woman, <laughs> right? Uh, and and this type, the player, uh, it's a device that I that I use in the book. I mean, I wanted to be a player in the mm -hmm. big league economics game. You know, right. I, I want to be somebody who, when I walked into the seminar room, everybody said, oh, that's Glenn. What's he yeah. working on now? You know, yeah. or I saw your paper in Econometrica. It was brilliant. I wanted to be that kind of a player. So it's it's all wanted, the same impulse, right? You you wanted to be the, the person in, in the center of everything. The master of the uh, universe master, is another a master phrase. Of a, yeah, a master yeah. of the craft, somebody yeah. who got his way, someone who knew the ins and outs and mm -hmm. uh, couldn't be fooled. Uh, someone who was on the on the uh top yeah. of, of the game whatever the game might be that was being played uh and yeah uh, do you I, explain I, I that a, i mean as a player. as an economist um how do you how do you kind of explain not that kind of ambition that makes sense but how can you can economics explain addictive behavior and self-destructive behavior or is that something that you have to go outside of e economics for well, I think of the late Gary Becker, and um, mm -hmm. I know he has a paper on addiction. Uh, and I think of George Stigler and Becker's mm -hmm. play, uh, classic paper in the AER, De Gustibus Non Disputandum Est, mm -hmm. about taste, there can be no dispute. Yeah. And and they, they do it all in terms of, uh, you know, intertemporal uh, uh, preferences where you build up a taste for certain kinds of pleasures and you, you invest in them and, you know, <laughs> that sounds like it's by guys who didn't get a lot of pussy, to be quite honest. I don't know. <laughs> right? I mean, like, that's where you are, you're not on the spectrum, right? Of most economists. Can you, yeah. So, do, did well, they my, get it my, right? Or, no, I don't think they got it right. I, I thought it was a reductive and uh, kind of you know, closed off. Everything's going to be optimal optimization. We just have to find the right objective mm -hmm. function. A way of looking at the world. I much prefer Tom Schelling's engagement with mm -hmm. the problems of uh, of self command, as he called it, and, yep. and addiction, which was understanding the conflict within the single individual, who at one point in time would 
want not to smoke or to use cocaine, but at another point in time would find themselves, notwithstanding their understanding that this is not good for them, being compelled right. to do it nonetheless. And the strategic interaction between those two types within the same person, right. uh, which is a fit uh, frame of mind for the memoirist, yeah. who after all is also wanting at one in the same time to be the author of and the subject of uh, the work right. at hand uh, and who communicates with an audience, which is well aware of the fact that the writer is writing about himself and uh, that is going to be taken into account. Yeah. So I, and I, you, I like you talk things. about the, the real story and the cover story. I mean, that's, that's the, the framing of the book is you, you tell the reader up front and then you come back to it at the close that, you're playing a game here. You're you're keeping us in, engaged by promising the real story as well as telling the cover story. That's right. And yeah. at some level, I'm playing a game with myself because as I try to recollect and reconstruct, am I the author of or the audience for the, the yeah. whatever the cover stories are that I might construct? Uh, about myself because you know the story of my life isn't all peaches and cream it's not all yeah. pretty and rosy some of it's pretty ugly and self-discrediting mm -hmm. you um i mean uh, certainly the you know the the frankness of your descriptions of your serial infidelities uh particularly with your wife linda who uh really comes across uh spectacularly well your late wife uh, Linda, um, she put up with a lot. I think you would be, uh, you know, the first person to say, but I mean, this is not a, you're not covering yourself in glory with a lot of this, uh, behavior as well as the, uh, crack. Yeah. I mean, you got into smoking crack. You, you described first encountering it when you, uh, were, uh, with a prostitute or a working girl. Um, can you say what, what was the pleasure of crack? Like, what did it give you when you were doing it? Well, Nick, thanks for remembering Linda, first off. I'll answer no. your question about crack. But uh, I, she was uh, my uh, soulmate, uh, the mother of our two sons, Glenn the second and Nehemiah, my life partner. And she stuck with me through no. thick and thin. And believe me, the thin was pretty thin. Yeah. Also, uh, a, a, an extremely highly regarded uh, economist on her, on, in her own right as well. We met at MIT. She did her PhD there, left in 1978, mm -hmm. uh, taught at the University of Michigan and at Tufts University. And yes, was uh, mm -hmm. an estimable applied uh, micro and labor economist who worked on uh, issues about the family and mm -hmm. uh, social capital and things of this kind and had some important papers. Um, and was a intellectual partner for me in my own development. And, you know, there wasn't any idea that I was working on that I didn't discuss at length with no. her and benefit from that discussion. But yeah, she stuck with me through thick and thin. <coughs> <coughs> and um, I, I gave her a lot of grief before it was over. Uh, and uh, I, I try to be honest with myself about where I let her down and uh, the, the ups and downs of our relationship, including right through to the end. She passed away in 2011 uh, from metastatic breast cancer, which she fought for the better part of a decade. And um, she died in our bedroom with our sons on either side of her and our dog curled up by the, by the, the porch door. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I, I miss her. Yeah, that uh, certainly comes through uh, on every page. Um, but you'd ask me about crack cocaine and yeah, because uh, the descriptions of it, you know, this this book again, it's you know, it it's a literary memoir as much as a professional one and a kind of treatise on political science and economics. And um, yeah, can you describe what what was it you know when you were uh, using crack that you got out of it? Well. So this is free basin cocaine. This is mm -hmm. preparing a mixture of cocaine and uh, other uh, uh, catalytic agents that allows it to be uh, transformed into a crystal that you can crumble and uh, put in a pipe and then uh, you, you smoke. 
it's very highly, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a scientific disquisition yeah. here, but it's a very highly concentrated dosage that's going right to the brain from uh, your lungs. And uh, that gives you a, a, a sense of euphoria that uh, is a, a marvelous feeling mm -hmm. that lasts for as long as it lasts, not very long, and then you want to take another hit. And it's highly addictive. And when you hmm. fall into the trap of using this substance, it can get to the point where it's the only thing you want to do. You know, you, you mm -hmm. spend all your time either getting it, thinking about how you're going to get it, how you're going to get the money to get it, and then about using it. Um, and yeah, I, I was, I, you know, I give myself the benefit of the doubt here. I was depressed because uh, I had been the subject of a, huge scandal. My girlfriend, outside of marriage, I had a mistress. Mm -hmm. I was keeping her in an apartment in the South End of Boston. She's younger, 23-year-old, graduate of Smith College, young woman whom I met and took up with. And I felt, had a falling out and an argument in which uh, I put her out of an apartment and physically mm -hmm. ejected her from the apartment. And she accused me of assault. I was charged by the Boston Constabulary with the crime of assault with a deadly weapon to wit my shot foot because she alleged that I had stomped her um, for what it's worth. I did not do, but I did put her out of that apartment physically. And, you know, uh, I had to reap what I had sown for myself in that in that situation. I make no excuses. Um, and uh, that had gone down. And uh, I, I had been scandalized. I had to withdraw because of this relationship from uh, a high level appointment in the second Reagan administration. The year was 1987. There was still a couple of years to go in Reagan's second term. And I was asked by William Bennett to be his deputy in the education department. I had to pull out of that job. I was on the front page of newspapers. I was already notorious because as an African-American who had written conservative pieces about civil rights issues, and who was a Harvard professor, I was well known. So this was just a terrible scandal and I wasn't handling the aftermath of it at all well. I was in the doldrums and was seeking some kind of relief from my depressive state and found myself wandering around the streets of Boston, picking up women. And one of these women whom I picked up uh, asked me if I wanted to try something and uh, I said yes. And that's how I got introduced to this substance. Uh, and once I was introduced to it, pretty soon the idea of the woman fell away and just the idea of getting the drugs. And I, I became one of those guys driving his late model vehicle around, well-dressed with a pocket full of money, yeah. pulling up to street corners where hooded uh, young men living in housing projects with little packets of white powder tucked under their tongue or in the bill yeah. of their cap or in their sock. And I'd pass a 20 or a two twenties out the window and a few of these packets would flow my way and I'd find a motel room somewhere or something and I'd go and I'd smoke it. And that became a way of life for me. Um, and you know, a way of death if I yeah. had persisted in it. You, uh, you talk about your, uh, going into, uh, rehab and recovery, uh, going through AA, um, and coming out on the other end. Is there, you know, uh, you, you mentioned Thomas Schelling and the idea of self-command is, you know, some critics of capitalism will say that, you know, drug addiction is kind of the apotheosis of capitalism, that it creates a bunch of things that enslave people and you just work to stay within the system and keep giving yourself pleasure. Your story in one way is about learning self-command and control over self-destructive behaviors. Is there a larger lesson, you know, from you know, kind of your struggles with addiction and your ultimate triumph over it, because you even now uh, drink occasionally, right? So you, I mean, it's like you've gotten to a different place where you're, you're more in charge, you're more of an autonomous self, right? Yeah, I, I, AA saved my life, okay? AA, mm -hmm. that community, therapeutic communities, the halfway house that I lived in for five months in 1988, uh, they they saved my life and and uh, I went to meetings faithfully for years and I abstained. Uh, I was clean and sober. I had a meet a week, then I had a month, then I had a year, then I had five years. Um, but I eventually drifted away from the AA abstinence 
mm-hmm. philosophy. Uh, and I talk about that a little bit in the book. So, for example, mm-hmm. I had been free from the use of cocaine for years. And then one day decided I was going to go and use again just to hmm. see what it felt like, because I was curious about what I had found that was so attractive about it and that I was willing to throw my life away for it. I, I couldn't believe it. And, and this taboo, if you use again, you'll go back to using again and you'll go back to using again. I, I didn't believe it. I mean, it was a little bit like the divinity of Jesus Christ. When I believed mm-hmm. it, I really, really believed it. And once I lost no. that vision, I, you know, it, 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 you know, so I, I, I did, and, and I was disgusted by the way it made me feel. It, it, it felt titillating on the surface, but it, it brought back a very, very bad taste in my mouth, so to speak. Mm. And I threw the pipe away, and I never, ever used again yeah. after that. But I, I violated this, this taboo. And likewise, after, you know, I don't know, four or five, six years of sobriety, uh, I started allowing myself a glass of wine at dinner. The sky didn't fall. I, I didn't suddenly revert to some monster. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, it's been, we're talking about the 80s, so that's over 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I last used the cocaine in like 1990. That, that's a good little while. Um, if I, you're, I, I, it's quite possible that this presidential election would be a good time to start using cocaine again. Don't you think? <laughs> Well, we have to factor in that yeah. I'm 75 years old. What am I going to okay. do with the rest of my life? You know, I don't, okay. I don't know that yeah. I want to spend it in walking around in a daze. <laughs> that but, may be preferable, but yeah. What, what do you think changed in you that you were able to kind of take it or take or leave these substances and these behaviors that were effectively uncontrollable when you were younger? I think I've got, I've, gain some wisdom over the years and uh, have a better understanding of what to live fulfilled and happy uh, living uh, consists in. I, I did uh, have a period where I was very religious. I, I was born again. Uh, this or initiated during a period when I was struggling to recover from uh, drug addiction, but persisted uh, long after I was out of the woods. And uh, it it was a it, it it changed my perspective a little bit. It it, it uh, the whole the whole experience of going through rehab and whatnot it, it quieted me down. It 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 uh, t- took me out of myself a little bit. It 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 uh, it was an, it was okay to be still. Yeah. You know. Like meditation, I started meditating when I was in recovery. You know, just trying to lie quietly and let my mind be clear and relax my, the muscles of my body. Be aware mm-hmm. of you know the tensions in my shoulder and my lower body mm-hmm. and whatnot, and relax and you know have a mantra. Mm-hmm. You know, just kind of quiet, be still. I, I started reading the Bible even before I was professing uh, genuine religious conviction. It's a classic text. You can't go wrong reading the Bible. There, there's a sense of, you know, outside of oneself, an immersion in something. Uh, I you know, there's there's beautiful literature there. I, I started memorizing passages from the Bible after I began to, to confess some belief of Psalms and uh, some classical uh, scriptural passages and so on. Um, g- going to meetings, uh you know, just living within myself, you know, uh, a, a kind of humility. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not in control, you know, let go and let God, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and you reconnected with your children. Uh, and I mean, you became a better person, really, right? When you When you became more centered. I think so. I think it's probably for them to say, but right. yeah. <laughs> but yes, I, I, including my son Alden, uh, mm-hmm. who was born out of wedlock when I was a young father. I already had two toddlers yeah. at home, and I had this relationship at work. And Alden came into the world, and I was uncertain about whether uh, 
he was my son about paternity and uh, without meaning any disrespect to his mother, who mm -hmm. was a wonderful woman. She's not, not living any longer. Um, Janice Brazan was her name. But uh, I, I actually ran away from my obligations to him and his mother. Mm -hmm. And it was years before I uh, finally acknowledged my financial Mm -hmm. uh, obligations. And years later, before I finally developed a relationship with him, mm -hmm. he was already in his 20s, uh, just as my father had been when he mm -hmm. first met his father. Mm -hmm. I I'm happy to be able to say that Alden and I have a wonderful relationship. He's in his 50s now. He has three yeah. children, my granddaughters, the oldest of which just graduated from law school. Wow. And I'm very proud of Amira Lowry, mm -hmm. and she loves her poppy. That's me, yeah. her grandfather. And it's a different world now. Uh, but yeah, uh, my my uh, recovery process and my period of uh, uh, Orthodox evangelical mm -hmm. Christianity uh, have left a, a mark on me. I want to uh, turn to your uh, kind of professional work or your your economic work in a second, but I want to come back to um, again. You know that the, your personal history is you know unbelievably compelling. Um, it's you know partly it's the Chicago setting, but it reminded me in a in a serious way of Native Son. Uh, by Richard Wright. Uh, obviously, he didn't grow up in the same poverty that Bigger Thomas did, but it's about trying to leave a world that is confining and interfacing with a white world and or a majority world you're not too sure of. But you talk about working briefly for a company with a company called Holiday Magic, whose slogan <laughs> was Rise Above It, which I think could also be a title for this book. Could you explain what Rise Above It was like, uh, you know, what did Holiday Magic do and why did you come back to that phrase, Rise Above? Okay, Holiday Magic was a retail cosmetics uh, concern, uh, like... Uh, uh, like Mary Kay um, or something. Yeah, right? like Mary Kay. Or like Avon, Mary yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, it worked through a system of distribution that had a pyramid scheme aspect to it. Hmm. So... If you came into the business and bought thousands of dollars worth of cosmetics and you recruited others to work under you and your organization to help to sell and distribute, you got a, a piece of what they made. And, you know, if they brought people in, you got a piece of the what was coming from right. the people that they brought in. So uh, it, it was something of a scam, I think it's probably fair to say. Uh, states attorneys general uh, throughout the country uh, had them in their sites for their business practices and whatnot, because it was pretty much a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you, you invested on the hope that others would be persuaded to invest under you and you'd get a share of what they invested in. Whether or not anybody actually sold any cosmetics was almost a secondary issue. But it was also just this kind of uh, self-help you know, I'm going to make something out of my life no. kind of cult. Uh, mm. they, they taught us to put a note in your briefcase that said what your goal was for being rich. You know, I want to make a million dollars. And every morning when you open your briefcase and you look at that note, think about what you're going to do that morning that's mm. going to advance you toward that goal. Uh, they, they had a, a two-day seminar at a hotel downtown Chicago. I write about this in the book which I paid my like 150 bucks, which was real money in 1968 yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> to, uh, to attend. And one of the exercises was walk out onto the streets of Chicago and get a stranger to give you $10. Mm -hmm. Look them in the eye and say, sir, I have a problem and, and I need your help. And I know that this is the hardest thing to ask. I'm asking you to trust me. You know, I lost my wallet. I don't have any way of getting home. If you give me your address, you know, I'll get you your money back um, and so on. And, you know, I, when, when I walked out of that hotel room and like after 15 minutes on the street, I had a $10 bill in my pocket for nothing, yeah. just for looking the guy in the eye and giving him the opportunity to help me. I thought, oh my God. But yeah, Rise Above It was one of their slogans. They had it was the bumper sticker. It was one of their slogans. And then the idea was whatever the obstacle. Yeah. It's on you. It's 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 a uh, Norman Vincent Peel. It's on you. Right. 
you, you can overcome this thing. It's a matter of will. No. It's a matter of determination. It, it, it's a matter of steady application of self. And you can be this thing that you want to be. Don't let them tell you you can't do it. Don't right. let them tell you you can't be rich. You can be rich. You're poor today, but you can be rich. Yeah. That's kind of, I mean, you believe that, don't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I did. And, and, and yeah. yeah. I do. I mean, it it doesn't have to be a scam, right? It's like you can actually improve yourself and your and your position, which seems like a, a good uh, segue into your you know your legacy, uh, your uh, professional legacy in economics and in kind of uh, political economy. What is the work that you're most proud of that you've accomplished? Because you and you were a hotshot technical ec economist. Um, and then you, uh, after a period of that, you moved into other fields. But what are you most proud of when you look at your economics uh, legacy? Well, I, I think my best technical paper was published in Econometrica, uh, which was is the leading technical journal in economics mm -hmm. in 1981. So that's a while ago. It came out of my dissertation. It's called Intergenerational Transfers and the Distribution of Earnings. Um, and it applies what at the time were state-of-the-art technical methods in dynamic optimization and the uh, behavior of dynamic stochastic systems mm -hmm. to the problem of inequality. And it formalizes the idea that uh, young people depend on the resources available to their parents, in part, to realize their productive potential as, as workers and uh, economic agents. Investments made early in life by parents and children affect the productivity of children later in life. That productivity is also dependent on other factors beyond parental control that are random, like the nat native ability and the luck. Mm -hmm. of the children, but it depends on the resources that are available. And that there are not, in the nature of the case, there cannot be perfect markets to allow for borrowing forward against future earnings potential so as to realize the investment possibilities if a parent doesn't have the resources to fund the investment no. themselves. There's no place to go to borrow to get piano lessons for a kid who might develop into a, a virtuoso pianist mm -hmm. uh, because uh, moral hazard and adverse selection and other mm -hmm. kinds of problems, those contracts are not going to be enforceable and they're going to be all kinds of information problems. So that market is very, very thin for forward investing in human development. And as a consequence, inequality has resource allocation consequences. The inequality of, among parents, some parents have a lot of resources, others have very little, but the kids all have comparable potential and there's diminishing returns to investing in kids. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking economics here. No, 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 of, yeah. The, but the net result is that if you could move money from rich parents to poor parents and indirectly in that way, move investment in kids from rich families to poor families, mm -hmm. The loss in the former would be outweighed more right. than the gain by the gain in the latter. So is of that returns. is that kind of a uh, a rebuttal to the idea that you can rise above it, or or if you're going to rise above it, you're not going to do it on your own, right? And, I, and I'm speaking from a libertarian perspective. I want as little kind of government transfer of income and opportunity as possible. But I think, you know, in that paper and in other parts of your work, you make a very strong case that if we want a more equitable society, like, you know, you got to do something to help kids whose parents don't have any resources. You know, I see them as two different realms of, of uh, uh, argument about human experience. On the one mm -hmm. hand, I'm talking about how markets work and how they don't work. Mm -hmm. There are market failures. There can be market failures and in, uh, incompleteness and informational impactedness and externalities and property rights are unclear and things like that kind. And you can make arguments about a role, maybe a minimal role for government. Uh, mm -hmm. I do start out friendly to laissez-faire, but you mm -hmm. can make arguments for government intervention to deal with public goods problems and to deal with in, uh, environmental externality problems and perhaps to deal with uh, market failure problems that are of the sort that I was just describing. Mm -hmm. You could try to make those arguments. On the other hand, 
if I'm talking to an individual about how to live yeah. their life, uh, about whether or not to delegate responsibility for their life to yeah. outside forces or to seize and, and to live in good faith, to, as I say, mm -hmm. stand up straight with your shoulders back, to take responsibility for what you do, mm -hmm. that's a different, that's like an existential or a spir almost mm -hmm. a spiritual art. It's about like how to be in the world as opposed yeah. to how the world works. Do you think that, uh, I mean, you're on college campuses now and, you know, campuses are more fraught uh, than they have been, uh, you know, I graduated college in the 80s and we had our own fights then. It's as bad as I, you know, I, I think it's been. Do you feel like that message has uh, disappeared? The idea, you know, everybody seems to be talking about systems, but not about individual responsibility. Are we out of kilter on college campuses and in other parts of society? Yeah, I think so. I'm low to uh, just spout off about about that. Uh, I really don't think you are, Glad. I think you're being falsely <laughs> humble right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's, especially with the uh, debate that's going on presently uh, about the war in Gaza and the campus mm -hmm. protest and the occupying spaces and setting up tents on the campus green and canceling graduations and seizing buildings and engaging in civil disobedience and whatnot. Um, but that all comes in the aftermath of the culture war that we've been fighting about critical race theory and about diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion. Uh, these arguments have been around for a while. And I've tended to be on the side of suspicion of the uh, pro so-called progressive sentiment that in, informs, especially around the identity issues, uh, thinking there's much too much focus on on race and mm -hmm. uh, sex and sexuality uh, as identities in the context of the university environment, where you know we our main goal is to acquaint our students with the cultural inheritance of civilization, mm -hmm. and there narrow focus on, you know, being this particular thing and chopping up the curriculum to make sure that it gets representative treatment of the various thing is feels stifling to me. And it, 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 it feels uh, a, a kind of, and especially if you let that spill over into what can be said and trying to silence mm -hmm. people or whatever, uh, the therapeutic sentiment, you know, we have our kids here, the kids have these sensibilities, we have to be uh, mindful of them. We 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 don't want to offend. We don't want to hurt. We we don't want mm -hmm. anyone to be uncomfortable. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. The whole point is to make you uncomfortable. You you came thinking something that was really a very superficial and undeveloped framework for thinking. I'm going to expose you to some ideas that run against that grain, and you're going to have to learn how to grapple with them. Mm -hmm. And in your maturity, you may well return to some of these, but you will do so with a, a much firmer mm -hmm a sense of exactly what it is that you're affirming and why this, this kind of, I, I want to educate you. I, 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 mm -hmm. I don't want to placate you. I'm, I'm, I'm not here mm -hmm. to make you feel better. Yeah. Uh, th this is my disposition as a general, um, as a general matter. You know, so you've been, go ahead. I'm sorry. Excuse me. No, I was just going to conclude oh. by saying in, in response to your question, yeah. uh, about uh, college campuses and uh, rising above it and and kind yeah. of uh, yeah I, I I do think there's uh, much too much reliance on pat system based accounts and you know and I, 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 let me just finish a sentence and, and much less of an embrace of the responsibilities that we as individuals have uh, in, in our education, uh, in our politics, uh, in, in, our, in our social and economic lives. You, um, you've been a, a stark critic of affirmative action, but you are also, you've been an equally uh, 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 vociferous critic of conservatives who say that uh, black identity or that, uh, you know, that set, that suddenly talk about colorblindness and not taking into account how people are different and where they come from and things like that. Could you, uh, you know, quickly kind of, what is the case against affirmative action that you put forward? And then what, how, how should we deal 
with differences in starting points or differences in experience where, um, you know, that are going to have an impact on how people end up doing? Well, I mean, they're the case against affirmative action, unfair to people who are disfavored. They didn't do anything to not be in the group that you decided you wanted to put your thumb on the scale for. Um, Has concerning uh, uh, incentive problems. Mm -hmm. I'm basically telling you, if you belong to uh, the favorite group, say your kid who wants to go to law school, it's okay to have a B average and to be at the 70th percentile of test takers and you can get into UCLA Mm -hmm. or or Stanford or Yale if you're black. But if you're white, you better have an A minus average uh, and you'd better be at the 90th percentile of the test takers. And, you know, I don't like the incentive properties of that. Yeah, and you talk about that as a kind of replacing racism with stigma. Yeah, but the and the concerns about stigma are not just in the context of affirmative action, although, of course, the systematic implementation of affirmative action amplifies the uh, concerns that one might have about uh, stigmatizing African Americans who would be presumed to be beneficiaries. This is the classic uh, complaint of Clarence Thomas is Yale law degree isn't worth anything because it's got an asterisk on it because of affirmative action. Do you, do you agree with that? I mean, and I know you, you've gone in and out of uh, a close uh, friendship with Clarence Thomas, but is his Yale law degree actually worthless? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I I mean, he keeps talking about it, you know, it's like the the effect is there. The effect is yeah. there in the direction that he yeah. uh, hypothesizes, but the magnitude of the effect seems, in my experience and judgment, not to be as great as he uh, would would make it out to be. Worthless, I, I think that's a, a gross overstatement. Yeah. Devalued, I, I think you could defend that position. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just also was going to say that there's something undignified about uh, not being held to the same standard as other people and about it being presumed of you because of the sufferings of your ancestors that you're somehow uh, in need of a special dispensation. I, I, I don't regard that as equality uh, in, in the fullest meaning of the term. You're not yet standing on equal ground when you're dependent upon such a dispensation. No. Uh, and and I uh, finally, in the case against affirmative action, say you, it's a Band-Aid. You're treating a symptom and, and not the underlying cause. The underlying reality is there are population differences in the expressed productivities of the agents in question. The African-Americans, on average, are producing fewer people in relative numbers hmm. who are exhibiting the kinds of skills that your instruments of assessment are intended to, to measure. And if you don't remedy that problem, you're, you're never going to get truly to equality. And by the time a kid gets to applying to college or graduate school, the the shaping and foundational developmental forces will have had their opportunity to do their work or not uh, from birth on through uh, young adulthood. And uh, you, you're kind of treating the effect and, and not the cause of the inequality. What is uh, What's the best way... Yeah, what what is the best way to deal with that? Because uh, you, you know, you rehearse. I mean, you've been involved in some kind of fantastic, epic, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, arguments of the day. And you talk at at one point about uh, when the bell curve came out by Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein and Dinesh D'Souza's "The End of Racism" and other books that kind of try to deal with okay, where are these population differences coming from? Where is it? Is it? F- primarily an effect of cultural change? Is it um, inherited, you know, differences in economic status and opportunity? Is it, re- is it genetic? Uh, where do these identity, uh, you know, where do these differences ultimately come from? And how do we get to those? How do we equalize those problems? Yeah, I don't think it's genetic. Though I can't rule out a priori that genetics could have an effect. I'm just not persuaded by the evidence that um, the early childhood developmental stuff, uh, you know, what's going on in the family, what's going on in the first couple of years of life uh, in terms of neurological development. I, I don't also underestimate 
the differences in the effectiveness of primary and secondary education uh, on average. And this is not just race. This is race and class and right. geography and whatnot. Um, I, I think we do ourselves as a society a lot of good if we it, were to follow the sort of wholesale reform movement in uh, K through 12, including charter schools and, mm. uh, you know, more uh, competition to the uh, union dominated public uh, provision sector of, of that part of our social economy. Um, but uh, uh, culture is a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I give a lot of evidence indirectly in my memoir about the effects of culture on life experience and the culture that nurtured me coming up in mm -hmm. Chicago had its positives it also had its negatives right uh norms values ideals uh what a community affirms as being a life well lived uh how mm -hmm. people spend their time about parenting uh things of this kind uh i once read this book by two asian sociologists min jo and jennifer lee uh respectively chinese and vietnamese sociologists the book is called the asian american achievement paradox and it attempts to explain based on interview data from uh, a couple of hundred families in southern california how it is that uh, these uh, uh, asian uh, communities are able to send their youngsters to places like harvard and stanford in such large numbers and it it basically makes a cultural argument i mean one of the chapters is entitled the asian f <laughs> It turns out that the Asian F is an A minus, <laughs> according to some of her, uh, yeah. some of their uh, respondents. If you come home with an A minus, the parents want to know a minus. Yeah. Why is there a minus? You know, uh, that that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think you can discount the importance of hmm. that kind of cultural reinforcement because right. at the end of the day, what matters is how people spend their time. Right. But it's also partly the system, right? I mean, this was one of the critiques. I know uh, Tom Hazlett at Reason, one of his critiques of the bell curve was, you know, it's weird that Chinese do so well in America, but, you know, in China, they were kind of poor. Um, so that it's, you know, it, you know, what Chinese culture is in America may be different than what it is in China. And then the large system you're part of also really matters. Okay. Uh, that sounds right to me. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I found most fascinating because you, you know, what I love about this book is that like you really confront all of your contradictions and your shifts in, you know, in good faith and an openness, uh, you know, and one of the things that you, you talk about, you know, you're, you're a critic of affirmative action and of kind of race-based policies, but then you also, t you know, you get kind of pissed when people are like, okay, well, we're not going to talk about, you know, the black experience because you say being an African-American or being a, a black American is really important to me. It's a part of my identity. Can you talk, you know, what do you take from your experience? You're specifically as a black American and, um, you know, why is that important to you? And should we all like, you know, instead of getting, you know, worried about saying the wrong thing around people. Is there a way for us to kind of bring our individual kind of cultural and ethnic heritage to the conversation that makes us more interesting and also rounds us out as people rather than divides us or, you know, or puts us in one group or, or another group? Yeah, I, I like the sound of that uh, brings us together because we all have a story. We all have a narrative and, and, and a, a cultural inheritance. We, we come dressed this way or that. We're not all dressed the same. And yet, you know, underneath, we are kind of all the same. And, you know, our struggles are uh, comprehensible uh, to each other. And mm. our, our triumphs and our failures are things that we can relate to as human beings. And that's how we should be relating to each other. Uh, and yeah, it is true when I ask myself, I mean, I'm in my 70s now and I've just written a book about my life. So who am I? You know, what, what, mm -hmm. does, it, what does it amount to? And it does amount to a certain degree that I'm the son of Everett and Gloria, that I'm the nephew of Mooney and Elois and uh, so on, that I'm the kid that really did grow up immersed in 
a almost exclusively black community on the south side of Chicago. The music that I listened to, the food that I ate, the stories that I was told and that I told to my own children in turn, the things that really get my juices flowing, that get me, that that engage me, that, that make me feel passionate about something. These things are related to the history, uh, the travails and struggles, the triumphs and accomplishments and achievements the dreams and the hopes of African-American people. Uh, th that's a part of who I am. And uh, it, it uh, annoys me, to be honest you, with you, when people attempt to say, get over it hmm. to me. They're not respecting me when they tell me that. Race is not a deep thing about people. It's a superficial thing. I grant you that. I, I, I grant you the no. melanin in the skin, the, the, the genetic uh, markers that are manifest in my uh, you know, uh, physical presentation don't add up to very much. Hmm. But the, the dreams of my fathers the, the, and mothers... Yeah. Uh, the 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 lore, um, the the narrative about who quote we close quote are that that's mm -hmm. not arbitrary and and it's not trivial. Yeah. And and it's it seems to me sociologically naive in the extreme to just want to move past that that that's a part of who people uh, actually are. Um. But, but I, I struggle with this because I also want to tell my uh, students not to wear that too heavily, not to let it blinker them and to prevent yeah. them from being able to engage with, uh, for example, the inheritance of European uh, civilization in which we are embedded. Yeah, that's also your inheritance. Tolstoy yeah. is mine. Einstein is mine hmm. and yours, I want to say to young, youngsters of whatever persuasion. And uh, don't don't be blinkered and and and, no. and don't be so parochial that you miss that you miss out on on the best of uh, what's been written and thought and said uh, in human culture. So that's a uh, I, I mean you I think have come up with a fairly fantastic synthesis in late admission, uh, and um, you know I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me today, but also putting out a book that is, I think, going to change a lot of people's uh, thinking, uh, I hope anyway. Can I ask as a final question, are you, I mean, you have been at this for a long time and you've gone, you know, you've seen, you know, things going up and down. Are you hopeful about kind of the American project, you know, that from, uh, from many become one? Um, you know, that we learn, you know, from each other uh, and that, you know, there's there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, mystical uh, trans transmutation going on here where we're we're building something different because so many people come from different places. Or are you pessimistic that we've, you know, fractured into, you know, a million tiny pieces that will never be able to kind of add up to something that is unique and different, uh, much less united. You know, I, I, it varies from day to day. Hmm. Um, I, I actually have two answers, uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'm optimistic, no, I'm not. And, and it comes from this, a, a common experience. I live here in Providence, Rhode Island, a stone's mm -hmm. throw from Brown University, and I'm a professor. And when I go to campus, I do feel a little pessimistic, to be honest with you. People are so dug in. On the other hand, uh, we have a house here that is kind of old and is in need of a lot of work. And uh, Miguel and Emilio are the co-principals of a small contracting concern. One of them is from Guatemala and the other is from Costa Rica. And they have a crew. And the crew are from Honduras and, and from Nicaragua as well as from Guatemala and Costa Rica and Venezuela. And those guys, and there are a couple of women, have been all over my house for the last six months. They're costing me a fortune, <laughs> but they are just such magnificent people, you wouldn't believe it. I know their kids, I know their families, I know the story of how they got here, the church that they go to, how they're running their business. They are magnificent human beings. 
we open the doors and people like that come in and they want to make their lives here. I don't know what other country in the world is like that. Uh, and that's pretty cool. That's pretty fucking cool. You know, and yes, I'm the beneficiary because I'm getting services here, probably a lower price than I would get them if the door weren't open. Yeah. But I look at that family, that set of families, and I say, that's the future of my country. Hmm. So that makes me optimistic. Yeah. Thank you. That's a wonderful note to end on. The book is Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. Glenn Cartman-Lowry, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you, Nick. It's been my pleasure.